Thanks, Jack. Um, we're in Esther. Uh, if you want to turn to Esther 8 in your Bibles, we'll be in 8 and 9, chapters 8 and 9 today. Mostly in chapter 8. And we're going to look at four um, topics today. Uh, first one is the rewards for Esther and Mordecai. Uh, secondly, the creation of the edict to save the Jews. The third is the substance of that edict. And then finally, the results of that edict. Uh, so let's begin with uh, the rewards. Um, and the previous chapter ends with Haman being impaled on a pole. Um, and he had set, of course, he had set that pole up for Mordecai, uh, but the king ordered him to be killed there after the suggestion of one of his eunuchs. And it, it, that wasn't enough. Now there are some additions to that in chapter eight. Uh, Jack, can you start us with chapter eight, uh, verses one and two? That same day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. All right, so, so Xerxes, I think as directed by God, gives Haman and, and to Haman's wife, uh, wife's complete estate to Esther. Now, what's interesting about that is that this includes Haman's house, but also his jewels, his gold, his cattle, his servants, his chariots, and, and much more. Interestingly enough, remember that he was going to give um, a bunch of silver in return for the opportunity to kill the people. And so what I, I looked at is, okay, um, Haman had 10,000 talents of silver, okay? Every talent of silver is 75 pounds. Okay, so so you you multiply 75 by 10,000 and then multiply it again by 16 and you have an idea of how much that was worth. And I calculated it in today's dollars. It's $277,800,000 in silver. So... I don't think Mordecai and Esther were looking for this, uh, but it was a nice addition. Um, and and Haman, interestingly enough, Haman who had acquired he had acquired just about everything in the kingdom, anything anyone could want, and yet he was embittered by hate for the Jews. And as a result of that, he died losing everything. There was nothing left for him nor was there anything left for him to pass on to his family. That quickly, he lost everything. Think about that. God can do that to every one of us. Hopefully he won't. He loves us. He cares about us. But don't, I mean, sometimes we fret and worry over our enemies and how they're advancing, how they're being successful. All these things happen, and yet God is in control. God is sovereign, and we have to believe that. And we have to act in our lives as if we believe that. Now, in addition, Xerxes had, had really taken back his signet ring from Haman and given it to Mordecai. Um, Jack, can you read that? Ancient kings used signet rings to designate authority on A signet contained an emblem unique to the king. Official documents were sealed with a dollop of soft wax impressed with the king's signet, usually kept on a ring on his finger. Such a seal certified the documents as genuine and gave the bearer of the ring carte blanche. All right, so what does that mean? What does that mean for Mordecai? Mordecai now has the signet ring. What does that mean? Yeah, Terry. The second in control, the second in command in the kingdom just under the queen, like Joseph. And if you think about it, you're we're talking about legacies here. What kind of a what kind of a legacy did Haman have versus Mordecai? Do you see any difference in those two legacies? What are the differences? Yeah, he's trying to take life where Mordecai was trying to serve it. 
you know, he was trying to protect people. So, so Mordecai is trying to protect his people. Haman's trying to kill them all off. Okay, and the people, the relationships are important because that's what we call a legacy. What do you think Haman's legacy was like? I mean, people bowed down to him. Does that mean they loved him and respected him? Why did they bow down? Bow down to him. They did the same thing to Saddam Hussein. Remember him? Okay. You think people loved him? And it was much easier for them to rejoice in his passing. So your legacy is really how you treat people and what you do, how you serve. Hebrews 6.10 and then Galatians 5.13, Jack. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Galatians 5.13, you, my brothers, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. All right, so we are called to be free, but don't, your, don't, don't use your freedom in the wrong way. Instead, serve each other. What does that mean, serve each other? What does that mean for us in here? Think more highly than yourself. Huh? Think of others more highly than yourself. So how are some of you serving people? Uh, let me kick it off with Jerry. Jerry, what are you doing for Scarlet Hope? Oh, we fix meals. We fix meals for them. Let's hear some other acts of service in here. A lot of water. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that, was, that was really service because I'm losing my voice. Yeah, Jack. I heard unruly people. You heard unruly people. Okay. Clarify that a little bit more. Just gather them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, what else? Huh? No, how do you serve? How, what, what, how are you serving? Where are you serving? Where are you giving acts of encouragement? We uh, just are uh, uh, trying to uh, be nice to invite people to your home. Every Thursday morning, what do you do? I meet mean, with my accountability partner. No, but every Thursday morning before that, uh, at six o'clock in the morning, Van Challen. And you're a table leader, right? Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I mean, that's where you get to ask some encouragement. You're yeah. with men and help them. Absolutely. Meet. Okay. Uh, help my dad and my parents out, uh, except for the house that would turn on, like, down the park itself. So. Yeah, it's for family. Our our uncle passed away, so okay. we're trying to help get it in a condition that they can. What are you doing right now? We're uh, no, you're serving. <laughs> you're serving. <laughs> okay, let's get to my Marvin. Thank you, women. Monday morning for Bible study. That's a mean Bible study. Be is that no. being sent? No, no. Oh, okay. No, no. it's home. Okay, and I have been eleven beds. Wednesday will be in the Bible study. Okay, but it's not BSF, right? No. Okay. Uh, I'm mentoring uh, a young girl, newlywed. Okay. I give out three boxes at St. Vincent de Paul. Oh, nice. On Tuesdays and Fridays. Okay. I work with leadership with uh, church around the country. Okay, great. I'm doing things to help my neighbor, Angie, who's been struggling with recovering from her aneurysm. Mike does a lot for his mother. Any other, others in here? Any others? Nobody else. So, so everybody's inactive, right? Everybody else is inactive. Yeah. We have the Red Cross blood drives to check people in and make sure that everything runs smoothly. So that, uh, people can get blood. And the Red Cross is, is dependent on volunteers to be able to do that. Okay, what else? Anything else in here? Yes. We help with uh, ice cream socials at senior living communities. Nice. And bingo. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Nope. yeah. Help with the leader in the program. You help with what? ROTC program. ROTC program is the leader. Okay, good. Yeah, P. Uh, in tandem with Calvin, we we secure food product uh, and distribute it, prepared and unprepared to multiple ministries uh, as far out as Shelby, Shelbyville, 
They have the time. All the way downtown and on into Indiana. See, see being, being a Christian is about exactly that, serving other people. I, I mean, yesterday I didn't know this, but Ron uh, Murphy um, served a little boy who was handicapped, who wasn't related to him, but he, but he was poor. The kid was poor, so Ron supported him with monthly support for how many years, Sharon? Twenty years, twenty years until the boy eventually passed. Medical, so point. So very quietly he served, and I think that's a challenge for each and every one of us. God has uniquely equipped us, okay? He's equipped us sometimes with financial resources, but he's also equipped us with gifts. So how are we using those gifts to advance the body, to serve the body? Because that's the challenge. Galatians 5, read that again, Jack, 5.13. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather serve one another in love so the challenge for us is to serve one another in love not you know i heard about i heard about bobby smith let me, let me, let, let's this is a matter of prayer let's pray for him. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever had conversations like that been part of conversations like that i mean that's a challenge it's a challenge for us not to participate in those conversations but to look more on how we can serve people. So Esther appointed Mordecai steward over Haman's entire estate. And it was probably pretty big uh, when she appointed him. Uh, why did I say, by the way, that God gave that and, and challenged or moved Xerxes to give them that estate? Why did I say that? Read that, Jack. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk, whose, whose walk is blameless. Isn't that what he did right here? Isn't that what he did for Mordecai and Esther? Okay, he, he showed them favor and he gave them honor. And certainly Mordecai was honored in the kingdom. James 1.17, right here, Jack. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So let me ask you, what did it mean for Mordecai, who'd been a quiet hero, to receive the signet ring? What did that mean? What did it mean for his people? Why did so many people rejoice over that? Well, it's a huge responsibility, but people rejoiced when they heard about that. Why is that? And we're going to talk about it so much so that they had a feast, which is called what? Purim. Okay, we're going to talk about that next week. But go ahead, Marvin. Yeah, he, they loved and respected him. And, was, and so they were glad to see a man that would do what he says he was going to do to take that office, not yeah. bring that into the trouble. The Jews. <laughs> Everything for the Jewish. <laughs> well, they knew that he was a righteous man. Well, and they knew that he would use that for service. Linda? Sort of affirmation for all who stood for and as a witness to the people around him. It was encouraging to be And Absolutely. And he had impressed Xerxes. And, and he, he, he really put him over all of the kingdom. And he did just like happened to Joseph and just like happened to Daniel. Do you remember those stories? Joseph and Daniel, they too impressed and received authority and they received power and they received responsibility in their kingdoms. So why does God do that? Why does God do that? They had faith. If you have your faith, God said, with the side of a mustard seed, we can move mountains. So, so they're men of faith. Okay. They're also righteous men, and they're men that God loves. Yeah, Peter. I think also that by elevating Mordecai, <clears throat> that the Jewish people overall throughout the land gain status and recognition that they didn't have before. 
Oh, well, absolutely. They, and, they've been a persecuted too. Yeah, Jay. Well, also, I think uh, God promised that he would, even though they were being, uh, they had been taken out of their country and captured, that he would leave a remnant and Mordecai would ensure that that remnant was left. Yeah, absolutely. There, there, there would be a remnant, and the remnant that were there were celebrating because they knew they were going to be safe. That Mordecai represented also safety for them. Yeah. At the end of Esther, it actually says and that uh, Mordecai was respected by not only the Jews, but all the people because he was he looked out for all the people, not just the Jews. And, and all of that is fine, but there's still a problem. And it's the problem of the original edict that was issued by Haman, but really issued by the king. It was still in effect. So Esther is going to try and persuade Xerxes to do something about it. She doesn't know what. She wants him to revoke that. He can't do it. So how does she do that? You see, Haman's like an enemy of God's people. Not unlike Satan and his demons. And like Haman, both of them seek to destroy us, don't they? Do you think do you think all of this child trafficking we're talking about? And by the way, that movie cost 14 million to make. Uh, and how much have they made so far? No. 140 million. 140 million dollars. That's a pretty good investment. Yeah, Terry. They surpassed um, the Indiana Jones movie. And last week they made more money than Tom Cruise's Mission Impossible. Yeah. So, so Satan means it for evil, but God turns around and changes it into good. And there are some good things happening. And you're hearing more and more and more about child traffickers being arrested and busted. So essentially, you've got Satan who wants to destroy us, wants to be destructive. And that's what the battle is, by the way. We're not battling against flesh and blood. That's what Paul said. We're battling against darkness and dark forces. And what's interesting about this is that we know, we know that eventually Satan is going to be destroyed. What's going to happen to him? To be thrown into the lake of fire. However, we've got to deal with God's first decree. Okay? What was God's first decree? What's that called? Called the law, is it not? And the law can't be changed. Do you understand that? The law can't be changed. The law is still in effect, isn't it? And those are who are guilty and part of the law are guilty of the whole law, right? So if you break part of it, you're guilty of the whole law. Is that not true? Yeah, that 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 still exists today. That verse is in existence today. Don't preempt me. Wait a minute. <laughs> but the penalty for breaking the law is what? Death. The penalty is death. Boom. Okay. And just like the king's first decree that couldn't be changed, God's law can't be changed. Do you agree with that? Yes. So God didn't compromise his first decree. I'm not done, Alvin. I'll get you in a minute. God didn't compromise his first decree. Instead, he made a second decree. And that's a decree of grace through faith in Jesus Christ, a new covenant. And he sent his son to fulfill the first decree for us. And that's how Jesus is both the just and also the justifier. Okay, go ahead, Alvin. Well, because of God and who he is, his law was perfect. He can't get any better than perfect. Therefore, it is still perfect. And he said not one jot or tittle of the law is going to disappear. It hasn't disappeared. still there. And if we're not, if we don't believe in Christ, you know, Mike, you told me an interesting thing about Don Waddell. Can you share that? 
By Don Waddell at a funeral yeah. service? Yeah, I was at a funeral service several years ago, and at the end of the service, Don spoke about how we'd line up, pass the casket, and say whatever we want to say. And he said, for those of you that are Christians, this is not goodbye. So you're not telling her goodbye. You'll see her again. But then he said, for those of you that are not Christians, you need to tell her goodbye. You're not going to see her again. <laughs> and if you know Don Wendell, you understand why he 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 kind of can be blunt from time to time. But he's speaking the truth, is he not? Yeah, always a colonel. Yeah, always, 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 he was a Don was a colonel in the Air Force, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I thought about it on Friday. Uh, I, I, I didn't, but on Saturday I had to speak at the gravesite again, and I did have an altar call. Uh, so, but 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 before we go further, I also want to look at something about modes of uh, of persuasion, and it comes directly from Aristotle. But I I thought I, I found it interesting, and what I want you to do is look at this. Uh, you know, there, there are three modes of persuasion, according to Aristotle. A logos, which is persuasion based upon logic. There's ethos, persuasion based upon the credibility of the speaker. And pathos, which is persuasion based on emotion. Now tell me, which mode do you think Esther is using here? Well, hold on a second. Jack, read Esther 8, 3 and 4. Esther again pleaded with the king falling at his feet and weeping. She begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman the Agagite, which he had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended the gold scepter to Esther, and she arose and stood before him. So I want to ask you this question. Is it drama for effect or true and raw emotion coming forth from Esther? What do you think? Huh? Well, you think it's all three of these modes, yeah. But, but. I don't think she's just trying to manipulate him. I think she's trying to save her people. Okay, now, now, all right, let me, let me try something on for you for a minute. So here's Esther the Queen, right? And, and she's a good looking woman. It tells us that in scripture. But she falls at Xerxes' feet, weeping and pleading for him to act. Okay? Now, guys, let me ask you a question. How do you respond when your wife falls at your feet, weeping and pleading? <laughs> Did you hear what Mike said? I'd call an ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Xerxes has had about enough of this by now. So he quickly extends his scepter. Esther rises, and the king waits for her to speak. Esther gathers herself, and she, tell, she tells Xerxes what's bothering her so much. Esther 8, 5, and 6, Jack. If it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favor and thinks it the right thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, Ah, uh, come on now, really? <laughs> if it pleases the king, and if he regards me with favor and thinks it's the right thing to do, he she already knows he regards her with favor. <laughs> Sticking up for the woman, huh? <laughs> All right, go ahead, Jack. Let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see the disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction on my family? I, I think she's absolutely sincere. I don't mean that she's not. But I also think that she's using every bag in the trick. Or every trick in the bag. <laughs> every trick in the bag. Um, and, and to add a little more oomph to this, she says, and if he's pleased with me. And then she asks, 
let an order be written overruling the edicts that Haman devised and wrote. Now, secondly, I want to take a look at the creation of the edict to save the Jews. Esther 8, 7 and 8, Jack. King Xerxes replied to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, because Haman attacked the Jews, I have given his estate to Esther, and they have hanged him on the gallows. Now write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews, as seems best to you, and seal it with the king's signet ring, for no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. So the king replies to Esther after she's asked him to overrule his prior edict and tells her he can't. Um, you know, that order to kill the Jews is still out there. Now, he says also that I've given my estate to, to, I've given Haman's estate to Esther. I've impaled Haman on a pole he created for Mordecai. He said, okay, I'll give you a remedy for my edict. My original edict that Haman created, I cannot revoke. It was verified by my signet ring. In other words, when a king gives an edict, it's a done deal. It can't be canceled. But he says, write another decree in the king's name. And it is also to benefit the Jews. So write what you want, he tells them. You've got carte blanche. Write it any way you want to. But make sure you seal it with a signet ring. So why the seal of the signet ring? Authority. Huh? It's authority. It is actually a sign that the king approves this and may have even created it, but whoever created it, it's got the king's backing behind it. And, and no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can ever be revoked, as we said earlier. Well, does that mean anything for us today? Does that mean anything for us today? We believe to God and, and request. He it shows that he can change things. And you see what's interesting about this is go ahead, Gigi. Sealed with the Holy Spirit. Christ. So we belong to him. So so the king's decree cannot be broken. It's interesting because like Haman was the adversary of the Jews, Satan is our adversary, is he not? He hates us. And he seeks to destroy us. Do you know that? He seeks absolutely to destroy you. And he knows what God's word says about breaking the law. And, and like God saved the Jews through the acts of the humble and courageous Esther and Mordecai, he also saved us through the acts of the humble and courageous Jesus. And we're told we should model that behavior well. Philippians 2, 5 through 9. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. So he says, my original edict that Haman created, I cannot revoke. It was verified by my signet ring. A king's decree cannot be canceled. So I'll, I'll let you write another decree in the king's name. And it's to benefit the Jews. So write what you want, but make sure you seal it with the signet ring. Okay. Now, I want to look a little bit more deeply into this. When Haman's edict came down, the Jews were helpless, except for the courageous acts of Esther and Mordecai. And one of the things that Esther did was she, she actually put her life on the line. Did she not? She put her life on the line for her people, and she was willing to die and sacrifice her life for her people. Did she, was she not? And, and as a result of that, what's interesting about this is, let me take a look at this. Mordecai creates a new edict. And the king destroyed the enemy's plan and created a second edict. 
You see, Satan used the, was not Satan using the law against us? If you're guilty of part of the law, you're guilty of the whole law. That was God's rule, so Satan used those rules against us. But G Jesus, God, confounded Satan by doing what? By sending Jesus for our salvation. And that second edict gave the Jews the hope and life and the cause for celebration that continues today. Now, so so just like it was for the Jews, the penalty, penalty for our breaking the law, breaking the Mosaic law in any way was death. And, and it's an edict, a covenant that's been written in God's word and cannot be revoked. Galatians 3, 10, 11. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. Now, I'm emphasizing this for a reason because this is important here. I look always for images of Christ in the Old Testament. And, and, and one courageous person, Jesus, came and was willing to die and sacrifice his life for his people. And through that sacrifice, think about this, he thwarted the enemy's plan. And he created a second edict, a second covenant, and that's a covenant of grace. And that edict gives us hope of life beyond the grave. And it's still celebrated today. We celebrated that Friday at Ron Murphy's Ron Murphy's homegoing celebration. I, I, I hate I'm, I'm reluctant to call it a funeral because it was really a celebration. And that gives us hope of life beyond the grave. And it's still celebrated. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I've gone through that a couple of times for a reason, and it reminds me of Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1.18. Jack, can you read that? I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened. Let's just stop right there. The eyes of your heart might be enlightened. What is he talking about when he wants the eyes of our heart to be enlightened? What is he talking about here? Tony. There's something in us that doesn't really grasp this, you know, and it, it needs to be internalized deeply. Yeah. And so that's why he's talking about the eyes of your heart. But he's praying that, you know, it's a revelation. It needs to be revealed from God that we have a hope that's in eternity. And that hope <laughs> is of the riches of his glorious inheritance. It's almost hard to grasp how amazing that it is. It is difficult to grasp. And it is the good news. It's amazing news. But guess what? Who's lurking in the background? Satan and his demons. And what is he doing? What is he telling you? That can't be true. It's no big deal. You know what? No one, no one could save a sinner like you, et cetera, et cetera. And so he likes to put doubts in our mind. Jack. Do you think when uh, Jesus was being crucified that Satan totally understood what that meant to his hope? Uh, agenda of using the law against believers. Well, here's what's interesting about that, Jack. I think Satan was finally befuddled by God because he thought in killing Jesus, that would be the end of it. That's always what I've wanted. Instead, what did Jesus do? Three days later, he rose from the grave. And he rose from the grave and lives. And as a result of that unselfish act, as we put our faith in Christ, he delivers us from Satan and his demons. But Satan and his demons want to still make our life as miserable as they can. In uh, Hebrews, I think an example of seeing with the heart is attributed to Moses regarding the reproach of Christ, greater riches than, than the treasures of Egypt, 
for he was looking for a reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the rage of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. I think that's with the heart. And that's part of what Paul is saying here. He said that you might be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Now, Gigi. Well, I just want to go back to what Jack was saying, because um, in, in Psalm 22, when it's talking about Jesus on the cross, and it says in verse 12, many bulls have surrounded me, strong bulls of fashion have encircled me. They open their mouths wide at me as a rab ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. I think the demons were rejoicing and tormenting him because they, they were thinking, ha ha, you're dead. Yeah, and, and this is Jesus. <clears throat> yeah. The creator and author of our, not only our faith, but our universe. He spoke everything to him. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Okay, so, so this is the creator of the universe, and Satan's harassing him. His demons are harassing him. Yeah, Tony. Because this, is, this is a 30-year conflict. This is not a three-year conflict. This is a conflict from the beginning of Jesus against this fallen angel, Satan, that Satan has been battling this whole time, and now he thinks he's won. And it continues, and it continues, and it continues, and, and, and he continues lying to people. Tony, you're working with, with uh, prisoners uh, who have been saved, and yet they still believe some of the lies, don't they? It's, uh, it's difficult to get the eyes of our heart enlightened yeah. <laughs> to the true glory of, of the salvation that they've been given. And, and that's the hope of the gospel, but it's also the challenge for each and every one of us. It's to, it's to understand when we are attacked, and, and we are attacked more regularly than you realize, but when we are attacked, it's important to rebuke that, to stay away from that, to get around fellow believers. That's why it says in Hebrews, not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together. Why is that? Do you receive support from brothers and sisters in Christ? Yeah, absolutely. So, so God's desire is for us to, and Paul's desire, is to internalize that message and to understand uh, in our heart, deep, as Tony said, deep in our heart, that we understand uh, that we know the hope to which he's called us. You know, that's the hope that Ron Murphy went on to, okay? And, and it's a blessed hope. And if, if he could have been there on Friday, he'd say, well, what are you all here? What are you worried about? I'm doing fine, yeah. That's what I love about this class. It encourages me when I go out in the world. It gives me hope. That's the challenge for us. And, and, and that's what's important for us, is that we are to build each other up. There are plenty of people and plenty of other forces in the world that decry us, that don't like us, that think we're old fuddy daddies, and we believe all that stuff for real. We come here to be encouraged to learn the word. Bart's getting ready to teach about Job. Uh, he's going to walk us through Job. And <clears throat> Job had a few things to deal with, did he not? So back to the story. The royal secretaries are summoned in Ephesians uh, 8, uh, uh, verse 9, 10, Jack. At once, the royal secretaries were summoned. On the 23rd day of the third month, the month of Sivan, they wrote out all Mordecai's orders to the Jews and to the satraps, governors, and nobles of the 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. Now, now, now realize it went out to all 20, 127 provinces, meaning that it essentially included everybody, okay? These orders were written in the script of each province and in the language of each people, and also to the Jews in their own script and language. Mordecai wrote in the, uh, Mordecai wrote in the name of King Xerxes, sealed the dispatches with the king's signet ring, and sent them by mounted couriers who rode fast horses, especially bred for the king. All right, so these horses were bred for the king. And they are, they make a mention here that they are fast horses and they were royal horses. 
and that meant that they were well cared for in addition to being fast. So, so Mordecai wants to get this edict out to everybody as quickly as he can. Uh, well, okay, what's so special about the edict? Uh, Esther 8, uh, 11 through 14, Jack. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate any armed force of any nationality or province that might attack them and their women and children, and to plunder the property of their enemies. The day appointed for the Jews to do this in all provinces of King Xerxes was the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adair. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers riding the royal horses raced out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was also issued in the citadel of Susa. So, so they distribute this to every city, uh, telling the Jews they can defend themselves. Uh, and, and gave them the right to destroy, to kill, and annihilate the armed men of any nation or province. Men who might attack them, their women, their children. They could also plunder their property, uh, which I think is interesting. They could plunder their property. And it was begin, interestingly enough, the same date as the other edict was to start. And since a copy was to go out to every province, it was written in various languages. It became a law in every province, and it quickly became common knowledge. It also rallied the Jews so they'd be ready on the day to avenge themselves. So let's finally take a look at the results of this edict. Um, and of course, at least partially, even before the edict, uh, Haman's dead. But but again, that came before the edict. Mordecai was also promoted, Esther 8.15. Mordecai left the king's presence wearing royal garments of blue and white, a large crown of gold, and a purple robe, robe of fine linen. And the city of Susa held a joyous celebration. So Mordecai goes from his current position, and a lot of people think that he may have been in the king's service anyway, uh, but in a lower position. And he went from his current position to the number two guy in the kingdom. Now he was wearing royal apparel and he had a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. So I decided to do some research on the color purple. Okay. What does it symbolize? I found one secular site that, that said the color purple is associated with a variety of meanings, including wisdom, creativity, royalty, power, ambition, and luxury. Now, listen to this from Michael Krosner. Can you read that, Jack? In most literary texts, purple is a color that shows wealth, royalty, and status. This fits within a historical context, too, because purple was often a color that was very expensive and difficult to make, and manufactured. As such, royalty would often be seen wearing it. Besides what he was wearing, how else do we know that he was pronounced to the number two or promoted to the number two position? Well, let, let, let's let's look back at, at verse two of chapter eight. Can you read that, Jack? Chapter eight, verse two. Yeah, hang on just a sec. The king took off his signet ring, which he had re reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai, and Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. So, so what does that mean? Again, king had taken it off Haman. Okay, and it wasn't in, uh, by the way, he didn't do that necessarily in, in, in uh, Mordecai's presence, but he had taken it off Haman. And he planned to give it to somebody, and he gave it to him, which means he's got carte blanche in the kingdom now. I found it interesting also because the month of Adar hadn't come yet. Yet there was joy and gladness and honor, it tells us. And this is only a third month, uh, and Adar comes in the 12th month. 
but they knew that Adar was coming and they knew that the king had given them a pathway to victory over their enemies. Yeah. Well, part of it was because of the extensive land that he controlled. It would have taken a month or more, even on a horse, to get to all the places that he ruled. But there were fast horses. <laughs> Well, but, but if you think about that, the king had given them a pathway to victory over their enemies. Isn't that the same with us? Isn't that the same with us? Don't we know that God is our conqueror and he has given us a pathway to victory over our enemies? It's not always easy. It's not always a piece of cake. It's not always fun. Just like the Jews did, though, we know the battles that may be ahead of us. But we also know that our ultimate victory has been assured, has it not? Has it not? Let me say that again. We know that the our ultimate victory has been assured. Amen? Amen. Okay. Fourth, their victory was so sure that interestingly enough, many folks became Jews because of their fear of the Jews. Isn't that interesting? I'm not sure that's the best incentive. So, so the time finally comes, the 13th of Adar was here. Let's take a look at what happened. Esther 9-1, Jack. On the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. All right, so the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but take a look, the opposite occurs, Jack. But, but now the tables were turned and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. So this is the fifth result, that the Jews overpowered those who hated them. Well, how did that happen? Well, first, it was God's blessing and protection on his people, the Jews. Secondly, the Jews gathered together, Esther 9, 2 through 4, Jack. The Jews assembled in their cities and all the provinces of King Xerxes to attack those seeking their destruction. No one could stand against them because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them. And all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the king's administrators helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the provinces, and he became more and more powerful. So they must have, as they saw the Jews, they saw them as a formidable opponent, because a lot of people were afraid. And the higher-ups and the brass from other nations decide to help the Jews. Why? Because fear of Mordecai had seized them, and Mordecai was prominent in the palace, but beyond. His reputation spread, and really, that, that was a big kingdom. I showed you before how large that was. In its width, it was well over 2,000 miles. So because fear of Mordecai, <clears throat> they came to the rally in support of the Jews, and his reputation spread. Well, what happens next? Esther 9, 5 through 10, Jack. The Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. In the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. They killed Parshandatha, Dalphon, Aspatha, Horatha, Udalia, Eridatha, Parmesha, our I, Usi. I included those verses just because I want to hear Jack. <laughs> I'm working it. Erudi, Vizatha, the ten sons of Haman, sons of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Now I noticed something here. They did not take the plunder. Why not? God didn't demand that they not take the plunder. I'm sorry? Oh. Well, the, the ten sons, the plunder from the ten sons of Haman belonged to Mordecai. Yeah, but there was plunder from the rest of the people they killed. I'll go through that in a minute. The decree had allowed them to take the plunder, okay? 
And I think it shows that they were not only interested in preserving their lives, I think they didn't want to get rich by violence against their enemies. And there's a reason for that. This is what the uh, Cambridge uh, uh, Bible commentary said. Let me, let me put this. In most literary texts, per that wrong one, that's, that's a little bit late. They took no plunder. Okay. According to the terms of the edict, they had a legal right to do this. Their desire was deliverance and also vengeance but not material gain. Consider the case of Abraham when he refused to make himself uh, liable for the accusation by overthrow of the Sodom. Now, Matthew Henry said that not taking the plunder honored their faith and showed a disdain for worldly wealth. But I have one more hypothesis on this, and I don't think it's far from wrong. In other words, why the Jews didn't take any plunder. Go back for a minute to the verses that Jack just read. Verse 5 says they struck down their enemies and did what they pleased to those who hated them. And it says they killed 500 men in the citadel, meaning around in and around the palace. And in, then in the same verses, uh, verse 7 through 9, it says they also killed 10 men who are named here. Now, what do these 10 men have in common? I'm sorry? Sons of Haman. Okay, remember this for a minute. Now, tell me, let's return to 1 Samuel 15, 1 through 3. Jack, can you read that? Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Well, that's a pretty clear directive, is it not? Coming from God. Okay. God told Saul to do what? Kill them all. Kill everything. Okay. Now let's look for a minute at what he actually did in 1 Samuel 15, 7 through 9, Jack. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur to the east of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. All right, so Saul, King Saul, disobeys God, a direct order from God. And in Esther 9, 5, let's go back there. Who were the primary enemies of the Jews who hated them? Who were the primary enemies of the Jews? Amalekites, okay? And again, all of those 10 sons of Haman were what? Amalekites. Now tell me how and what Haman's background was. He, he was an Agagite who was an Amalekite, okay? See, Agag's the king of the Amalekites and likely the men Haman hired in the citadel, citadel were also Amalekites. It makes sense. And Agag was great, but he was also brutal. First Samuel 15, 33, real quickly, Jack. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so your mother will be childless among women. And Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. So Agag put him to death. Now, Balaam was prophesying about Israel, and he said this in Numbers 24, 7. Water will flow from their buckets. Their seed will have abundant water. Their king will be greater than Agag. Their kingdom will be exalted. Still, Agag was a warrior king, and he was responsible for many deaths, and they were probably merciless and brutal. So are the Jews both telling? This is my question. This is my hypothesis. Are the Jews both telling and demonstrating to God something they remember from their history? 
And what they remember from their history, and, and if, as a matter of fact, this may have been their prayer. Lord, we remember what you said to King Saul. Lord, we want you. We know you hate the Amalekites and you wanted them and their belongings totally destroyed. This time, we're going to do everything we can to comply with what you said to Saul. And even though we have liberty to take plunder, we leave it this time so you know we're obedient and we're not like King Saul. Now, the king finds out the number killed, and he reports the results to Esther. And he said, he asks, if there's anything else she wants, and surprisingly, she comes back with another request. Uh, and, and, and we'll close pretty quickly. Jack, read that. Esther 9, 13 through 17. If it pleases the king, Esther answered, give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow also and let Haman's 10 sons be hanged on gallows. Now, now, does this surprise you about Esther? Uh, we're thinking of her being a sweet young woman and, and <laughs> give us another day. We got some more killing to do. <laughs> Go ahead. So the king commanded that this be done. An edict was issued in Susa and they hanged the 10 sons of Haman. The Jews in Susa came together on the 14th day of the month of Adar and they put to death in Susa 300 men but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. This Se happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th day, they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. So 75,000 of their enemies were killed in one day. But again, none of their plunder was taken. And I'm guessing that most of these enemies, in my opinion, were probably Amalekites. Now, to give you some perspective, in Vietnam, we lost 58,220 American troops over 21 years. So 75,000 is quite a bit. What happened in Vietnam in 21 years is less than what happened in Persia in just one day. Lynn, the Jews are still paying a price for not killing the Canaanites like God told them to do. Still paying the price. That's that's exactly right. Of course, they're still paying the price for Abraham's lack of faith as well. But the results so far are Haman is dead. Mordecai has been promoted. There is joy and gladness and honor in the kingdom. Many have become Jews out of fear. The Jews overpowered their enemies. And in addition to all this, Purim is established as an annual festival, again, a celebration. And finally, Mordecai is exalted. Now, these last two points we're going to study next week.